Welcome back to our introduction to OpenMP in small bytes. My name is Christian Terbofen from RWTH Aachen University. In this video, I'm going to cover the topic of work sharing. So if you remember from the last video session, we looked at the parallel construct, which provides us what we call the team of thread. So we have the initial thread and the set of worker threads, which together execute what we call the structured block which is a code block in C and C++ programs um, out of which the parallel region consists. However, usually where we want to go parallel, we want to actually speed up the execution of our program. So if we just use a parallel region without anything else, each thread within the parallel regions team will execute the content, meaning the body of the parallel region. If we want to get a speed up, we have to distribute the work, which comprises the parallel region, among the threads, which comprise the team of threads. And um, in OpenMP, we have a set of so-called work sharing constructs, which exactly do this job. The most uh, popular and most commonly used work sharing construct is the so-called FOR, or in Fortran, the DO work sharing construct, which partition a loop a for loop in C and C++ or a do loop in Fortran and execute the iterations um, in parallel on the team of threads. This is shown on this slide, C and C++ on the left and Fortran on the right. So for the sake of simplicity, we have a very short loop iterating from zero to 99 and adding element wise the arrays B and C and storing the result in A. This is probably not something that you would parallelize in a real code because the problem is too small for the overhead to pay off. But I have an illustration on the following slide. So what is the idea? We want to partition the loop. That means split up the iterations into, let me call them chunks for the moment, and execute these individual chunks by the threads of the team. If we do that in parallel, we obviously can hope for a speed up. So that means our program executes faster than if it would execute sequentially when only one thread is available. Again, take a note and in OpenMP, we do not express the degree of parallelism, meaning the number of threads that's actually uh, going to be used as a hard coded value or in, in a particular way. Instead, the usual mechanism, as we learned in the previous video, is to use the OMP num threads environment variable at the time the program is started to determine how many threads shall be used within a parallel region. So let me show you the idea first, then I'll give you um, a more detailed explanation how loop iterations or the distribution of loop iterations to threads can be influenced. And I will also show you an example uh, underlying, under, yeah, explaining that the program will actually um, experience a speed up. Why is the for work sharing construct the most important one? Well, in many programs, at least in scientific technical programs, loops account for most of the program's runtime. So what's going to happen if we parallelize the loop as shown here? This is shown on this slide, and I tried to use some pseudo code, which actually looks pretty close to uh, Fortran code. So assuming we have a serial code, then there would be one thread that executes the iterations from zero to including 99 and uh, performs the operation as I just explained it. And the idea, um, if we're going parallel, for example, with four threads is that the iteration space is divided into as many blocks or chunks as we have threads. So the first thread will iterate from i equals zero to 24 the second from 25 to 49 and so on. And as I just mentioned, the OpenMP runtime is responsible to divide the loop iteration space um, in such a way that all the threads available in the OpenMP uh, parallel team are exploited. What I'm also trying to show here is the access to the shared memory. So we have the arrays A, B and C, which are all available to all the participating threads. But in this particular example, we make sure that each individual thread only reads a certain partition of B and C and writes to another certain partition of A 
which all are disjunct, so that means there are no conflicts. Let me show an example that this actually works. So this is my simple vector addition code. We have again a C code, we have a parallel region which actually initializes the arrays A, B and C and then we have a parallel region which I'm trying to highlight now Oops. that spends um, um, a larger number of rows. I will explain it later on, but the, the rows 45 to 50 actually show the work sharing construct that I just um, explained. I believe it can highlight the code like this. So we iterate from zero to the dimension of the arrays, which actually is a much larger value than 100 in this particular code and do exactly the operation that I just described. This is executed again as in pragma with a pragma on before. So the loop iteration are distributed among the team of threads and um, in between or around uh, we use an OMP get W time API call, which actually measures the time uh, it takes for the kernel to execute. So we can actually measure a speed up. Let me compile this code. I will ask the Intel compiler ICPC for C++ to actually perform some optimizations because it's a memory intensive uh, code. We actually profit from using caches. So we want the compiler to recognize um, the architecture. Again, I enable OpenMP compilation and uh, the, the compiler gives me some warnings which are due to our, of course, by our installation. We can ignore that uh, at this point. I will execute the code with one thread first and uh, it takes uh, 0 0.5 seconds with one thread. Let me execute it with two threads. So that means that I mean the arrays are kind of split up and each thread is responsible for half of the iteration space. So we have 0.25 uh, seconds execution time, which is to speed up a little bit below two. Executed with four thread, we have uh, 0.13 or 14 seconds of execution time, which is again, a speed up a little bit below two. So what I'm just trying to say here is that the OpenMP parallelization works. Let me just go back to my slides. Yeah, this was a demo that I wanted to show you. I said we can influence the way in which loop iterations are distributed among the team of threads, which is what is shown on this slide here. So what I'm just showing here are three different, uh, let me call them schedule kinds. Uh, so this is a clause schedule that can be added to the OMP4 construct with additional arguments. And uh, you can choose from static, dynamic, guided, or what is not on this slide, auto, with a chunk size being optional. So the default is static, and let me just explain what's uh, happening here there explicitly. So if you do not say anything, there will be a schedule static selected by the OpenMP uh, implementation with no chunk size being specified, and that means that the iteration space is divided into blocks of chunk size, which is not given. And that means if chunk is not specified, we get as many blocks as we have threads. And the idea is that thread zero will work on thread z uh, block zero, thread one on block one, and so forth. If a block size is specified, um, the value of block size, meaning the value of chunk, iterations are grouped together and distributed to a thread um, yeah, as a chunk of work. And then the blocks of the given chunk size are assigned to a thread in the round robin fashion. So block zero to thread zero, block one to thread one, block n to thread n, block n plus one to thread zero, and so forth. That works well if all iterations are more or less of the same computational cost. If some iterations, excuse me, if some iterations are more expensive, then we have to uh, we would encounter a load imbalance. And that means some threads would have more work to do than others. And this is what we have the schedule dynamic for, which is the second one um, given here. That means the iteration space is again divided into blocks of chunk size. And if not specified, it's one. So it means iteration by iteration. And the blocks are scheduled to the threads in the order in which they finish their previous work. So it means whenever a thread has finished a chunk, it will grab 
the next one until finally all chunks, uh, chunks has been completed. So that means while one thread might execute lo um, a more computationally expensive chunk, others might proceed and actually execute more but cheaper chunks. Why isn't that the default? Well, in many cases, if you work with arrays, matrices, represented as arrays and so forth, you want to optimize for um, data locality and that means neighboring um, iterations often profit uh, from data locality because of caches and they should be executed by the same thread. And this is why static without a chunk size is a default. But you should consider dynamic, maybe dynamic with a certain chunk size to again let the code profit from um, um, neighboring iterations uh, using the same data structures and then in consequences ca in consequence caches. So if you have such a, a scenario then um, with different computational loads, schedule dynamic might provide a solution. If uh, you want to save a little bit of overhead, um, schedule guided might be an option. It's very similar to dynamic, but the block size starts with an implementation defined value and then is decreased exponentially over the course of the computation down to chunk, which is one if not specified explicitly. So now we learned that we can parallelize a for loop with the OMP4 work sharing construct. Can we parallelize all the for loops that we might encounter in the program? Unluckily not, because of correctness. So there's a simple test. Yeah, if you uh, would take a look at the code and execute it backwards, yeah, that means to think about what would be the result if the iterations are executed in just the reverse order. And then if the result differs, yeah, then it means you have to be really careful if you execute it in parallel because the ex result of the computation depends on the order in which the computation are being performed. However, if you take at the, an example at this uh, simple test, yeah, assuming uh, the correct initialization, you could execute the loop backwards but still come up with the same result. That means this test alone is not sufficient, so you really have to take a close look at um, your code in order to determine if this is uh, correct. What do we have here is what we call a data race and that happens if between two synchronization points yeah, two or more threads access the same memory location and at least one thread writes to it while at least one other thread reads to it then the result is not deterministic yeah, because the result depends on the order in which threads actually read and write to and from this memory location. So what is the problem in this particular code? Well, we have only one variable s and in each iteration, a thread reads s, adds something to it and writes the result back. If two threads would simultaneously read s, uh, add something and write it back to the memory location, one thread would go first, the other would go second and then overwrite the value of s at this, correspond at this particular memory location. Let me just add some sp uh, special remark here. So Pragma OMP Parallel 4 is different from Pragma OMP 4 that I was showing on the previous slide. You need both in order to parallelize a loop and you can write them into the same line, which is then a combined construct, or you can write it into different lines. We need the parallel in order to create a team of threads. That means to have worker threads available, including the master. And we need the for in order to partition the loop iteration and execute it blockwise or chunkwise um, by the threads within the actual team. So what I'm showing here is equivalent to writing pragma on p parallel and then in the next line pragma on p4. So let me come back to um, this correctness problem that I just explained. What we need is uh, some kind of synchronization when dealing with S. And there's a synchronization construct that I would like to introduce, which is called OMP critical, same name in Fortran. A critical region, which is implemented by the OMP critical, is a region that is executed by all threads, which will encounter it, but it's guaranteed that only one thread at a time is able to execute it simultaneously. That means it implements mutual exclusion. No two threads 
can be present in the same critical region at a certain point in time. If you have multiple critical regions which kind of guard or may, uh, access to different shared variables, yeah, then you can introduce a name because if you have two or more critical regions with no name or the same name, they all implement a mutual exclusion um, for all the critical regions within this name group. If they guard different values, then you have to use different names. The name is optional, so if you do not put it, it will be the default name. With that, we can actually implement a solution. We write pragma will be critical, and in this critical region, we actually uh, perform then the update of the variable s. Assuming that the array would be larger than just 100, do you think the solution scales well? For the moment, let me just answer no. It certainly does not scale at all, but I will explain in more detail how we, solution, uh, how we will solve that later on. We need another construct for that, which I will introduce in, a, in the next video series. Let me just uh, go to a few more constructs which relate to work sharing. So we have the barrier construct, which implements a barrier. If you write an egg barrier, like pragma -OMP barrier in C and C++ explicitly into your code, then all threads will wait until the threads of the current team have reached the barrier. It's important to understand that work sharing constructs, like the for construct, contain an implied barrier or an implicit barrier at the very end. Not at the end of the parallel region, but at the end of the work sharing construct. And that means yeah, at the end of a work sharing construct, the threads can only continue after they have completed all the work in the work sharing construct. You can get rid of this implicit barrier by using the so-called no wait clause, just write it behind the OMP4 or any other work sharing construct, work sharing construct. But for the sake of correctness by design, the barrier, the implicit barrier is there. You have to understand that the barrier synchronizes the thread. So that means uh, threads can only pass a barrier after all have reached the barrier. But it doesn't mean that all threads will immediately start after the barrier. That again, as so many other things in parallel programming, depend on the operating system. And if the core and core uh, executing a given thread uh, just got busy with something else, the thread might have reached the barrier but will only later on continue um, after uh, the core is available. Two more constructs, the single and the master construct. Pragma OP single, on, shown on this slide, again, consists of a structured block. It's specified that the enclosed structured block is executed by only one thread of a team and only once. So that means if two or more threads arrive at the single, the runtime will select one thread that will execute the body of the single constructs. The others will jump around and wait until the one thread has finished executing the structured block that comprises a single construct. This is because single is also a work sharing construct and that means it has an implied barrier or an implicit barrier at the end. Again, using the no wait clause, you can get rid of it. So that means the other threads will jump around and execute the code after the single. What do we need it for? Well, if we want to do IO, for example, writing an out and final or an intermediate result while still being in a parallel region, we can use a single. If we want to do memory allocation or deallocation, yeah, think of calling a malloc. In many cases, we want this to be done by only one thread. Again, single could be a solution. And as we will see later on, the single construct is really important in the context of task parallel programming. But this is a topic of a later video uh, sequence. The master construct, pragma -OMP master, is different in two things. So first, it's defined that the master, meaning the initial thread, will execute the structured block, the thread with ID zero. And it's not a work sharing construct. So that means there's no implied barrier at the end. All the other threads will jump around and immediately continue. That's different, uh, the two differences between master and single. Single means one thread will execute it. In many implementations, it's the first thread that arrives, but this is not at the construct, but this is not guaranteed. And the master construct is not a work sharing construct. So there's no implicit barrier at the end. 
Finally, let me make a few remarks on the runtime library. So we, we have seen two API calls already, which were OMP get num threads and OMP get thread num. OMP get num threads, as I just uh, said in the previous video, returns the number of threads in the current team. When OMP get thread num returns the number of the calling thread in the team, meaning the ID, which uh, the, uh, means that the master has always the ID zero. With the API, you can also specify the OMP uh, the, uh, with OMP set num threads, the number of threads to be used for the next parallel region that will be encountered. So that means it's something that's most often called within a sequential part and overrides the value of the OMP num threads environment variable that we use to execute or to determine the number of threads for the execution of our OpenMP parallel program. So with the IDs, yeah, OMP get thread num, OMP num threads, we could also partition a, a loop so that threads, excuse me, work on individual parts of the loop iteration. If we do that, however, in many cases we will see not as, as good performance as with using the work sharing constructs because then the compiler doesn't quite understand, uh, to put it like that, what we are asking it to do. So that means if we say pragma on P4, the compiler understands what we're doing, while if we use manually thread IDs to determine what thread should execute what, the compiler basically only sees something like calls to a runtime library. Yeah, and with that, um, I would like to close this video sequence.